hashtag Hive Data. There's a lot of people outside this room who are also following the conversation, and if you want them to hear what you're saying, use the hashtag. I'm incredibly excited to have Mike Olson here uh, tonight, a uh, friend of the Hive. Mike has uh, significant uh, accomplishments, especially in the database area. Uh, uh, he's going to talk a lot about Cloudera today, but uh, of course, as uh, founder as the as the CEO till 2013 now VP of strategy at, at Cloudera he did uh, uh, Berkeley uh, he did sleepy cat which was the Berkeley DB uh, company which was sold to um, Oracle uh, he's been at Illustra he's been at, who knows Britain Lee <laughs> old guys uh, we, we used to work with this woman Paula Hawthorne yep. who, who drove us crazy but she <laughs> <was definitely. laughs> Michael Bell she said you guys trying to database you know nothing about database <laughs> so uh, so you know uh, his, his oh and one important thing he he went to Berkeley he did uh, uh, he studied at Berkeley and his professor just got the Turing award yeah. and, Hi. And, and and so that's that's a, a, a huge thing, um, and so um, I'm not going to say much about Cloudera because I'll give him a chance to talk about Cloudera. But um, it's an incredible story of you know how to take uh, uh, software that is free, and uh, and and you're not the only one who's trying to sort of monetize it. There are a whole bunch of other guys. Um, his old company Pivotal, and I don't see any Mapa people here today, or Hortonworks people. So everyone's trying to do it. So that's an incredible story as to how to do that. And uh, at least the last time I heard, you know, they they raised a, huge, a boatload of money, and uh, you know, at massive valuations. You know, many times what an IPO would would be. Uh, you know, with people like Intel and others and that thing. So they are set for a long time. So the format we'll have today is we'll have a mic talk uh, for about 40 minutes or so, and then um, I'll just moderate uh, uh, a, a Q and A. So uh, I'll ask a few questions, and hopefully you'll ask a few questions. And and uh, there are many people here who are interested in how to you know create an enterprise startup in this sort of consumer world we live in. You know, you you hear about just, you know, Instagram and Pinterest and this and that. And in that world, how do you how do you build an enterprise company? So with that, please join me join me in giving a hand to my course. Am I live? Can you guys is my microphone on? You just have to move that. Perfect. Check, check. Nothing's lit up. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm dead. Yeah, it's still not. Uh, Ravi, you want to spot? I'm going to spot. Ravi, it's your left back, left pocket. Too many pockets. Repeat it. The good thing about this is Ravi can't ask any questions now. <laughs> <laughs> he is loud, though. So. <laughs> All right, so listen, if I do this right, as you heard, I'll talk for maybe 40, 45 minutes, uh, and then we'll go to Q&A. Um, and I'll use the 40 or 45 minutes to try to seed topics that I think you folks will find interesting. Um, as you heard, I'm a database guy by training. I'm an engineer by inclination. Uh, I was wired to write C code at a very early age. That's no longer a saleable skill. <laughs> luckily, <laughs> luckily, I went over to the dark side. I started doing sales and marketing and sort of customer facing work. Um, I switched from developing software into management and customer facing roles when I was at a company called Illustra. We commercialized the Postgres code that came out of UC Berkeley in the middle 1990s. That company got acquired by Informix in 1996, uh, and I spent a little bit of time there before leaving and joining uh, Sleepy Cat, 
Uh, Sleepy Cat was started by Margo Seltzer, who's currently on the faculty at Harvard, uh, and Keith Bostick. Uh, the three of us were all at Berkeley simultaneously. Uh, Keith was on staff, and Margo and I were both database students for Stonebreaker. Bostick at the time was working on a version of Unix from Berkeley that you didn't have to pay AT&T license money for. So he wanted an entirely unencumbered version of the Unix operating system. So he would go around and ask people if they would rewrite pieces of Berkeley Unix uh, and basically give them to him. Uh, Margo and I were database people. I used to run a Friday afternoon study group at the Triple Rock Group Hub in Berkeley. Uh, and I would convene a group of people there and you know we would do a lot of hardcore research. Um, Keith used to come to those meetings and ask us, Margo and I, if we would write a version of the DBM library, the embedded database library in Berkeley Unix. And Margo and I are like, you know, we got a job, right? We're both graduate students. There's no reason for us to do this thing. Keith was so pers persistent that we finally agreed to do it, just kind of to get him off of our backs. I will say, Keith was so persistent that Margo eventually married him. <laughs> <laughs> so keep asking, I guess. Is the, end of the, um, the two of them took that original version of DBM, later called Berkeley DB, and continued to develop and enhance it. And, and we'd done the work in 1991. By 1998, when I was sort of looking around for a thing to do after uh, being at uh, Informix and then messing around a little bit, Margo called me up. She said, yeah, you, you remember this software we wrote called Berkeley DB? I'm like, no, I, I don't remember that. She said, no, no, we wrote a, unit, we wrote a Usenix paper about it. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm pretty sure I remember we wrote a paper about it. Well, I went and looked in the Usenix proceedings, and indeed, there was a paper there that we both authored. Um, <laughs> she and Keith had continued to enhance that software. They'd actually gotten some commercial interest, and they'd even struck a deal with Netscape Communications to pay them to do a bunch of NRE. Um, Berkeley DB was open source. And at that time, there were precisely zero examples of a successful open source company in the world. Nobody believed that you could build a business. At the time, just for clarity, Red Hat was selling CDs and t-shirts. That was the state of the art, open source business models back in the day. Um, Keith and Margo crafted an unusual strategy. So Berkeley DB, out of Berkeley, had this very permissive license. Anybody could pick it up and change it, take it proprietary, enhance it, embed it in their own tech. No royalties, just, you just had to say something nice about the university, that was the only requirement. <laughs> you were allowed to relicense it if you wanted to under your proprietary license, any terms you liked. Keith had this, in retrospect, genius idea. You could relicense it however you wanted to. He took it and essentially relicensed it under the GPL. So now you've got this library that carries viral license terms, GPL license terms, which means that you can pick it up, you can use it, you can enhance it, but if you embed it in your software, if you ship it to anybody, you have to open source your thing too. Right? It infects the code that uses it. We didn't use the word infect at the time. But that was the effect. So here's the really smart part. <coughs> Sleepy Cat, the company that Keith and Martin created, owned the copyright in the code. They'd written basically all of it. They could sell you the antidote to that GPL license. If you merely paid them money, they would sell you other terms under which you could distribute the software. So they offered well, the first ever dual license strategy. Um, so free for anybody who wanted to give their source code away. If you were a traditional software, ISV, OEM style vendor, you could merely apply some money to the problem and <laughs> ship proprietary software. That was the first time I think that anybody had really figured out a way to monetize open source that didn't basically rely on a crappy version for free and a good version for money. That was the founding of Sleepy Cat. Um, Keith and Margo actually were interested in, we were in the late 90s, interested in finding some money for the company, getting some backing. And we went around and talked to venture capitalists who all responded with the same basic response, which was, are you kidding me? <laughs> <laughs> the software is free 
and somehow you guys are going to make money on volume? Right? I don't understand. Right? So we couldn't raise any money. Um, the result was we built a very, very unusual business for the times. Remember, this is like the dot-com boom. Everybody's going nuts. Sock puppets are raising billions of dollars. <laughs> uh, we basically grew our business on revenue, right? unheard of at the time. So we took no investment. Frankly, we could get no investment. So we went out and we sold a bunch of deals. Um, at the end of every year, right, we would have made more than we'd had to spend. We would hire additional staff as the business grew. Um, we were privately held, owned by just four people, me, Keith, Margo, and one other engineer, Mike Ubell, um, whom some of you data, database folks may know. Um, it was an unusual business at the time for a lot of reasons. Because we were privately held and had no outside investors, the end of the year would roll around, we'd have a big wad of cash in the bank, we'd bonus all of our employees, basically proportionally to their stock option holdings in the company. So it's kind of like they were getting a dividend. And then we would pay ourselves the rest of the money. We'd keep a couple million bucks in the bank to run the company for a couple quarters while we went out and sold a bunch more software. If you talk to people about these sort of slow growth, organic, bootstrap companies now, people say lifestyle business, like it's an insult, right? <laughs> The cash lifestyle's kind of nice, but I gotta say. It. <laughs> Plus, we didn't have to put up with non-technical people driving our business. <laughs> there are good reasons to put up with that, as you'll hear when I segue to Cloudera. There are lots of reasons you want to do that. But look, we knew the customers we were talking to. We knew what they needed. We felt we were the best possible arbiters of uh, what they desired, and, and, and we had the freedom to make those decisions to make the investments that we chose to make. And it was a fantastic story. We grew the business for a bunch of years. We got to a respectable revenue level that we've never publicly disclosed. But look, I mean, we, we, we had a good little company. What we didn't think we could do would be grow it globally. We didn't think we were gonna be able to open operations in Japan and Korea and significantly across Europe. We've been sucking cash out of the company for a bunch of years, right? We needed money to do all that stuff. Nobody's spouse thought it was a good idea to put all the money back in. <laughs> um, as a result, we decided we had two options. We could go raise venture capital, or we could pursue strategic investments. So find basically a company to buy us and, uh, uh, and let them grow the business. Uh, and we hired bankers to pursue those two options simultaneously. Here's what we discovered. Every single venture cap, oh, I'm, and, and I'm sorry, I should dial back to this. But like 99, 2000, it was impossible for us to raise money. You know, 2002, the company started to throw off respectable cash. All the embedded database players imploded in the dot-com bust, except kind of for us. So, you know, it had been a market with 18 people and now there's us and one or two others still standing. The venture capitalists are beating on our doors, right? We'd love to help you guys out. We're like, we don't really know what we do with your damn money anymore. Right? <laughs> um, by the time sort of 2005 rolled around, we knew we couldn't continue to grow the business the way that we had. So look, we need cash. Either we raise venture capital or we sell the business. The downside to venture capital were pretty considerable from our point of view. First of all, we would no longer be able to decide to do whatever the hell we wanted, right? We'd have a real board telling us what we really needed to do. Secondly, that thing where we pulled out all the cash at the end of the year, yeah, not so much, right? That was gonna stop as well. Um, because we would still be privately held, there was still a bunch of go-forward risk. Would we succeed in growing internationally? Could we build a great business? So in parallel to the VC discussions, we ran strategic, basically, the bank went out and, and pitched the business to a number of prospective buyers. I was like, we talked to a lot of companies. Um, I disclose nothing that is dangerous to disclose when I say that uh, lots of interest, none of it deep, except from Oracle, except from Oracle. And I got to tell you, it surprised us a little bit, right? I would not have bet that Oracle Corp would look at our very proud of it, but pretty small embedded database company and be excited about bringing us in. Now, some good stuff about it. We had a really good team of technical people. We had cred in the open source sector, which, you know, middle 2000s is sort of of some value. Um, and it turned out that Oracle was in, interested in building out a portfolio of embedded technologies at the time. 
Uh, long story short, although it had not been anybody's pick as the favorite to get the deal done, we were very pleased with the deal that we were able to put together with the folks at Oracle Corp. Uh, to the extent that the entire Sleepy Cat Berkeley DB engineering team uh, still in place, including many of the original Sleepy Cat engineers, but there are a lot more engineers from uh, Oracle working on Berkeley DB now. Uh, it is a piece of the Oracle product portfolio, including Oracle's NoSQL engine, right? So um, the company has done a lot with it. Um, I joined Oracle after the transaction as Vice President of Embedded Technologies. Uh, I had a very good time at Oracle. Mostly what I did was fly around the world and help the Oracle field understand how to sell these embedded things, right? Uh, very different from the traditional Oracle database. Um, I met a lot of very smart people. I enjoyed my time there a great deal. Uh, I've said in public before, and I think it's even been tweeted, so I probably can't be busted if I say it again, but uh, I was not able to get an expense report rejected in the entire two years that I was there. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not like I didn't try. <laughs> Um, Oracle treats its acquired company CEOs very, very well. Um, I made a lot of very valuable relationships. Um, in 2008, I left Oracle uh, thinking I would take about a year off. Um, my sense of boredom welled up and I got about five months into that before uh, I had decided what I was going to do next. Um, I'll segue to the Cloudera story in a minute, but I want to set it up in this way. Um, Google did the original work on scale-out storage, the Google file system, and on its processing framework, MapReduce, in the early half of the 2000s. Short out the second microphone here. <laughs> um, so the Google file system paper was published in 2000, 2001. The MapReduce paper was published in 2004. Everybody I knew in the database industry read them at the time, and call me on this. You guys, it was a joke, right? I mean, no query language, no transactions. I mean, you guys, we know how to build large-scale mission-critical database management. This Google crap? Are you kidding me? That's like you just pat the little guys on the head. Yeah, 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 it's nice. You go play with your toys. We're going to deliver stuff to banks over here, man. Um, what we didn't understand at the time uh, was that Google wasn't trying to solve our problem. Right? It wasn't aimed at OLTP or OLAP or sort of ODS problems. It was a new class of scale out, very flexible analytic and processing workloads that Google needed to support. Um, <clears throat> and fundamentally, it needed to scale incrementally to thousands. We always brag in the database industry about our ability to design scalable systems. <clears throat> we mean to like eight, right? <laughs> you don't really get big in traditional databases, and look, I mean, big global shared namespaces with shared locking infrastructure, that's just expensive and hard to make work. <laughs> Hadoop was, actually Google MapReduce, was really the first system that I looked at that scaled like not messing around to a thousand, right? And it just got really, really big incrementally. That was transformative. When I left Oracle, I decided I don't want to be a database guy anymore. I've been working uh, in the industry since 1986 when I was at Britain Lake. Um, I frankly competed with Larry Ellison for 25 years. It sucked. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we finally sold the guy a company, ra racked that up as a W. I decided I want to go to something else next. And in 2008, because I wasn't going to be a database guy anymore, I gave myself permission to take a hard look at Hadoop. And I got to talk to folks at Facebook and at Yahoo and at Google who had been using it in production. And I want to tell you guys, it was like one day, you know, the heavens part, the lights shine down, the angels sing, right? It's like, oh my God, I see. It was, it was no more than a week, no more than a week between sitting down and talking with Jeff Hammerbacher at Facebook and realizing why this platform we had totally misunderstood, right? So I believed then that there was a big opportunity to build a company delivering this software to enterprises. Um, and I did what you do in Silicon Valley when you have an insight. You quickly go look for competitors, right? So I walk around, I talk to everybody I could find. I go to Google, you know, hey, Chris, do you know anybody who's doing anything with this MapReduce stuff? And, and I talked to the venture capitalists I knew. I found three other people who believed as I believed and were going to start a Hadoop company. Christophe Ishilia at Google, 
uh, Amr Awadala at Yahoo and Hammerbacher, the guy who included me in, at Facebook. All three had decided that they were going to go make a Hadoop company happen. Um, kind of early, middle, summer 2008 at this point, and I'm looking at this thing and I'm going, you know, so there's going to be four companies pursuing a zero billion dollar market. <laughs> <laughs> and you know we're going to have to compete on price, right? It's going to suck. It's going to suck. So my mission that summer was to convince those other guys that we should roll our four companies into one, collapse our cap tables, and just have one company in the space. And there were some pair pairwise relationships, but the group didn't know everybody well. Uh, nobody had worked together before. So it's kind of a risky thing, right? I mean, one of the lessons I learned at Sleepy Cat, as great as that company was, it's like four founders, you guys, is a mistake. It's too many people in the room. <laughs> go do this damn thing again, right? Um, Jeff, Amr, Christoph, and I spent the summer dating, right? Convincing ourselves that we were gonna be able to build a company together. Um, we succeeded in that conviction by sort of August of the summer. We agreed as a team we were gonna to come together. Almost came true. Christoph wound up leaving Cloudera in 2010, but the other three of us still around, all in very, very different roles from the founding, of course. Um, but so by the end of August, you know, look each other in the eyes, you know, spit on your hands, shake them, blood brother stuff. Um, we decided we would have one company. We spent September kind of writing a strategy document and a business plan, which is a very amusing act of uh, uh, work of historical fiction, when I read it now. Um, we put together a pitch deck in uh, the latter part of September. And then we were going to get, go out and talk to venture capitalists. And of course, we kept the VCs warm during the period. We you know, made sure they knew who we were, what we were doing. There was one investor in the Valley who had decided that he was going to fund a Hadoop company, right? Ping Lee at Excel mm -hmm. had gotten all excited about what Hadoop could do, and he was going to put money into somebody's Hadoop company. So I had spent the summer taking all the Hadoop talent off the market, right? I mean, I better go get the money as well, right? Um, I knew Excel, but not Ping from previous life. But we had a really good conversation. I mean, basically what we said was, if you guys excel, will give us a fair founder deal, then we won't shop this thing, right? We'll just do the deal with you. If you make us feel like, you know, we're not getting good value, hey, look, we gotta get a market price, we're gonna go out and do it. Ping was excited by the team we'd put together. He, he knew Jeff a little bit, he was really excited to do that. Um, so uh, by the middle of October, we, I'm sorry, early October, we had a team, term sheet, we burned through diligence, and like October 14 or something of 2008, five million bucks from Axel, bam, you know, hit the big thump in your bank account, right? It was a resounding Silicon Valley sound. Um, <laughs> like two days later, Lehman Brothers declares bankruptcy. <laughs> <laughs> you guys laugh. You know what happened? Silicon Valley, I'm sorry, uh, Sand Hill Road closed. Just <laughs> nothing, man. You. If you knew how to turn lead into gold, you could not get money, right? There was just no money. So, you know, I mean, for all of us individually, it's a pretty sucky time, right? You know, your houses are risky. For Clara, it's awesome. We got five million bucks of cash in the bank and no prospect of competition. <laughs> Simultaneously, every large enterprise on the planet is trying to figure out how to drive cost out of its IT. And we got this scale out inexpensive storage infrastructure, right? <clears throat> Yeah. I like to say that it is important to be good throughout your career because sooner or later you will get lucky. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and really, I mean, I feel like that's what happened to us, right? Our, our, uh, our instincts were good on the technology. Sorry, I just want to go to my notes and be sure I'm hitting everything. Our instincts were good on the technology, but our, uh, our timing was really, really fortunate. Um, End of 2008, early 2009, Hadoop wasn't a thing. The only people who knew about it were working generally in engineering in the consumer internet companies. A few of those folks are in the room tonight. But by and large, no one in the market had ever heard of this technology. The meme of big data had not yet happened, right? Those words hadn't yet broken. 
Uh, in fact, Chris helped me deal with the company who owns the trademark on the term big data, oh. who uh, oh. lodged a letter into us that we needed to do. Did you guys know that that's a protected term? No. Yeah. I've got a salute that doesn't involve all of these fingers <laughs> for the people on it. Look, um, those, those words, those ideas hadn't percolated in the market yet. The result was, you know, we're in market with this geeky open source technology where every single piece of it's named after an animal. <laughs> you should never let engineers name stuff. <laughs> um, no one really understands what it's for. Right? Yeah. Our early sales were all super, super evangelical, right? Explaining, first of all, why data mattered to you. And then, and then hey, by the way, there's this cool new technology. It's open source, uh, and it can help your thinking. Oh, by the way, we're an open source company, so let me tell you how that works, right? Um, the folks that we did business with earliest came in a couple of camps. There were the web companies, broadly, consumer internet. You think of online music folks and ad placement folks, and they totally knew what the software was, and they had been rubbing themselves raw trying to keep it in production, and they heard that Cloudera was in the market. They could pay some support money to somebody, and uh, like a guy would show up if something broke, right? <laughs> so we got to do some early deals with those folks. And then there were some forward-looking more traditional enterprises that were keeping their eyes on emerging technologies and, and looking for promising stuff that they'd use in the data center. Financial services and telecommunications are legendary as early adopters of technology, uh, and they lived up to it in this case. So they, uh, a few large banks and a couple of large telcos engaged with us early. Now, 2008, 2009, we bundled up those open source bits. We've got CDH1 available. Um, and it was really just HDFS and MapReduce. There was nothing else in the box at the time. Um, still very hard to use. Our packaging uh, was the main thing that basically we, we plowed our engineering effort into. And, and then we said we sold support contracts. But early on, the support contracts were pretty much you tell us what you need and we're going to show up and work with you to make that happen. We used those early engagements to figure out what product opportunities we had in the market. That was important. We always intended to be a product company, a software company. There are now a number of players in the market uh, around Hadoop. Our strategy is distinct, we believe, from all others. And in fact, all of the vendors differ from one another in significant ways. But let me describe Cloudera's philosophy and how we build a product. So it is, uh, it is an article of faith at Cloudera that platform software has to be open source. So nobody chooses proprietary OSs in a broad scale out way anymore. You just don't, Linux changed that, right? If you think about the database landscape, lots of new database adoption, and certainly most of the database growth, is going into open source technologies, not proprietary technologies. The pieces of infrastructure that are plumbing in the data center are all moving to open source. Look at uh, look at middleware, look at databases, I said. CIOs prefer that a single vendor not lock their data up, not lock their analytics or their data processing workloads up. And so if an open source product is basically at feature parity with a proprietary version, proprietary guy loses every time. The open source product can even suck a little bit relative to the proprietary thing because <laughs> You know that software gets better over time, right? By the way, that was a second knock on Hadoop early. A lot of us didn't understand. We all looked at MapReduce and we thought somehow that was a law of physics, right? So it was written in Java and it was hard to program and batch mode latencies and, and therefore there was a deep architectural flaw. It turns out MapReduce was just a distributed processing framework and you could dream up other ones that would run on the scale out data infrastructure. And over time, the platform got much better than just that original processing engine. Anyway, the, the conviction is the plumbing, the infrastructure software must be open source or it can't win. And, and it can start out worse than proprietary alternatives and still win enough to invest in and get better. And that's what happened with Linux and certainly what's happened with the Hadoop ecosystem. All right, so you gotta be pure play open source in the platform. 
right? You've got no choice. You're not going to win customers otherwise. Here's the problem. And we got this a little bit from Sleepy Cat, but much more we observed it in the open source ecosystem in the early and middle 2000s. It's just blindingly hard to build a large business on pure play open source delivering only services, right? The problem is, as the market gets more competitive, big vendors with a lot of cash come in and drive the platform cost to zero because they can afford to do that. So if all you've got is the same open source bits that a big vendor has, they're gonna beat you on price every single time. You may be able to win the deals because you're more expert, because you're better, but you know what? You're gonna win it at pretty close to zero on price. The, the, the market will force your price down if all you have is open source bits. Result is, we believed at Cloudera, we need some defensible IP that a big vendor can't come in and just take. The platform has to be open source, that's non-negotiable or they won't adopt it. So what can you build that is proprietary that sets you apart? Not proprietary to lock the customer in, but rather to lock Bigco out, right? That's what was, in, that, that was our strategic thinking from the very beginning. What we did was build management, monitoring, administrative tools. So those of you in the database world think Oracle Enterprise Manager, but for Hadoop, right? The data database layer basically is all pure play open source, but if you want to deploy, operate it, then you're going to buy the console and the dashboard. And no matter what vendor you go with, you're going to have a different console or dashboard. Our strategy has always been to complement that open source platform with proprietary differentiation to maintain a separation between kind of platform stuff and our proprietary tooling. Over time, our proprietary IP has changed as the market has matured, and that'll continue to be true. But we go to market with proprietary software alongside open source. Um, and it's worked. Uh, we've got a bunch of very big deployments. We released some numbers a couple months ago, so we're north of 100 million bucks in revenue on our last fiscal year. Uh, more than 525 accounts as customers. That is, you know, pick a large bank. We may have 10 deals with that bank, but accounts as one customer. So we're not a big company yet, but we're not a startup anymore. We're a growth stage business. Um, and the market as a whole is growing. So we're seeing lots of opportunity for expansion and so on in our install base. Um, I believe that strategy permits us to continue to invest as we need to in differentiation growth. So we always want to be a product company. It's key to have the best product in the market, which means we need high revenues at good margins that allow us to invest in further innovation, right? So right now, uh, we've got the largest revenue stream, we're reasonably cash efficient, uh, and we've got a significant cash pile, and I'll tell that story in just a minute. But it lets us invest in the platform and continue to differentiate ourselves. So philosophically, strategically, that is who Cloudera is as an open source vendor. I, actually, the last thing I'll say is, Two companies in history have broken uh, 100 million bucks as pure play open source vendors, us and Red Hat. Uh, and Red Hat is a great example and, and one we strive to emulate. They just closed out a fantastic year, like 1.6, 1.7 billion in revenue, so. Uh, okay, so business grew from those early days, 2008, 2009 into a real enterprise player. We began to do larger deals with more traditional style customers. The installed base grew, the company grew. As many questions as you guys wanna ask about that, I'll be happy to answer. Um, just a little bit more than a year ago now, uh, we had our most significant funding event uh, in the company's history. <laughs> The uh, trajectory of funding at, at the business was a Series A round in 2008. I told you that five million bucks of Excel money. I closed the deal, so I actually should know what the number was for our Series B. Um, it was a long time ago. Maybe, maybe another six and a half or seven came in in, uh, in May of 2009. Greylock led that round. We did a third round about a year and a half later we didn't need the cash. And, and actually that's been true of every round that we've raised except for, the, except for the A. We didn't go out looking for it, it came to us. In general, we've had all of the cash from the previous round still in the bank when we did the next round. When we raised our Series C round, we were dealing with large banks and they were just worried about our staying power as a vendor, right? They, they would look at my balance sheet and say, man, a strong wind would blow you away. I can't afford to do a big deal with you. 
you got to bulk up. So we went out and raised 25 million bucks from Meritech in a Series C round just in order to have 25 million dollars. Right? We didn't want to spend it on anything. We just wanted to reassure customers that we'd be able to be around. We raised a few more rounds, netting 141 million dollars over Series A through E. And, and objectively, you guys, 141 million dollars. It, it sort of seems like you should be able to get a company going on that kind of money, right? That's you know, that's a respectable amount of cash. Um, in the tail end of 2013, the beginning of 2014, uh, we decided we wanted to prepare for IPO, so we did what a lot of companies did. We went out to raise what's called a mezzanine round. So instead of talking to tr traditional venture capitalists, you go to Wall Street and you talk to public market investors. Uh, so T. Rowe Price is our example. They mostly only invest in the public market, but these days they will sometimes buy equity in the private market from a promising company that they're excited about. So as a company preparing for IPO, you want to go do that deal because later on when you go hit Wall Street and you're on your roadshow for your IPO, all of the investors go, well, T. Rowe's in there, so you know, these guys must be okay, right? So T. Rowe led our Series F round with a couple of other public market uh, buyers. Um, and uh, a couple of individual investors, Michael Dell came in, Google came in. Uh, but anyway, that was great. We raised another 160 million bucks. Uh, and we figured that was kind of it. We had reserved a small portion of that round for strategic investment. So I talked about Dell, Michael Dell, and I talked about Google. We began talking with Intel in the latter part of the year, into the, uh, like through New Year's, about joining as a strategic investor. Um, Intel had a big strategic interest in expanding consumption of servers in the data center, right? Um, Intel has like 94% market share, right? There's no growth when you've got 94%, right? I mean, you, you, know, you, you don't get to go get that other like 3% and brag about it, right? The only way that you can drive more consumption, drive growth is by driving more servers into the data center. But it turns out Hadoop does that. Right, it's a big scale out. Lots of racks full of you know Intel boxes, um, and by the way, Intel is keen to drive computation, networking, storage into the environment at large. All this Internet of Things, or as I like to think, call about it, Internet of almost soon to be compromised things. Um, <laughs> that is all. All of that is a good place for in, Intel Silicon to land. Right. Um, by creating an ecosystem that is big data friendly, Intel creates a larger market for its hardware, right? Um, so we began strategic discussions with Intel. Now they'd had a big data play of their own. They were in the market with Hadoop on their own account. Um, we really liked the Intel global field and their ability to basically reach the entire planet. I think they liked a lot who we were and our focus on open source and our ability to drive the projects forward. I think they liked the business philosophy. Um, but for our, from, from our point of view, strategically at Cloudera, the thing we liked best was Intel knows today what's going to be in the silicon five and ten years from now, right? I mean, they designed some chips and then they got to go build a wafer fab factory. Right? I mean, there's a long lead time in produ producing those chips. So they know exactly what architectural features they'll be delivering to the market in the out years. By working with them, we get to look into the chip pipeline for the coming years. And we get to optimize the software to take advantage of new computational capabilities, new memory and network architectures, we all design for servers today. A lot of our bigger customers now are designing for racks, so every bit of storage in a rack is sort of equidistant from every processor. If you go talk to the architects at Facebook, they think in those terms about their data center, right? The servers we build for are going to look very different in years to come. So if we get to look at that chip roadmap, we can drive the platform forward, we can innovate in the product. Remember, we want to be a product company. We can still have the best product on the market. That was super attractive to us. Intel wanted to protect itself in the big data ecosystem. So like here's the nightmare scenario, right? Intel strikes a strategic alliance around Hadoop with 
Cloudera, and then IBM buys Cloudera, right? And then Intel is kind of standing there with nobody to dance with, right? Um, result was in exchange for the strategic partnership, which we really badly wanted, Intel wanted to be sure that they were able to defend themselves in the market. They insisted on a meaningful ownership stake in Cloudera as a result. And we negotiated for a long time and we settled on 18%. Um, and just because that's where we could settle, I think, is the answer to the question. Um, Intel paid $740 million for 18% of Cloudera. We did not do it because we needed $740 million. We did it to look at the chip roadmap. Intel wanted to put the money in in order to protect itself. Now, no Intel exec makes this claim. This is just me talking independently. But if IBM were to show up right now with an offer for Cloudera, there's an Intel executive on my board of directors <laughs> who would know that that had happened. And she could recuse herself from the vote and saddle up and compete for the deal. And here's the genius part. IBM or any other company has to buy 100% of Cloudera. Intel just needs to buy 82%. <laughs> it's locked in a discount, right? It's locked in a discount. Um, they believe, I think, that that protects them. Certainly, we like it because we believe it assures our path to IPO, right? There's no point for a big company to make a play for us if they know that they're just going to get outbid, so we're not going to have to put up with that distraction. $740 million bucks. On top of 160 in the mezzanine round, on top of 141 in Series A through, you guys, we've raised more than a billion dollars in cash. This is a software company, right? I mean, like I feel like we should side business building airplanes. <laughs> it's ridiculous to have that kind of cash if you're in the software business. It wasn't our intent to raise that kind of money, but with that cash pile, we've actually got some real options. We will, we want to, we intend to uh, have an IPO one day. We want to be a publicly traded business. But you know, there's no time pressure on us at all, right? There are a lot of reasons to have an IPO, right? It's a great branding event, gives more transparency to customers who want to buy your products. Um, it's great for morale inside the company, gives people liquidity. For most companies, it's because you need the cash, right? For Cloudera, it will not be for that reason. We're in a position right now where we can invest in ways that the public markets might not let us do. And in fact, we've been acquiring companies over the past couple of years, about a peso one a quarter lately. We made some buys that we're really pleased with. We're in a position to keep doing that. I gotta go convince my board of directors, but they know us, they know our strategy, and they're generally pretty supportive of what we're doing. I don't have to go convince Wall Street that a non-accretive acquisition makes sense. If it makes sense to us strategically, we can just go do it. Right? So we've got that latitude. We still intend to IPO, but we're in a position where we can do it when it makes sense, when the timing is right for us. And that's absolutely what we intend to do. Um, the business is going great. I guess the, the one other anecdote I'll tell and then maybe try to wind down, I'm coming up on my 45 minutes self, uh, self allotted. Um, I was the company's founding CEO. I stepped out of that role in the middle of 2013. That's 2015, yeah, middle of 2013. Come up on two years ago now. Um, so you guys understand how that went. When we started, there were four of us sitting around a borrowed conference table in a conference room of the AdMob offices in San Mateo. That was the first place that me, Christoph, Jeff, and Homer found to work. Um, by the middle of 2013, we were 425, 430 people spread across the world. Um, you can imagine 425, 430 folks consume a lot of cash and so good financial planning is absolutely essential and some discipline and CFO style operations is a big deal. Um, the revenues were getting big enough that it was starting to get important for us to be able to forecast pipeline and you know when deals were going to come in and you know get a little, little bit more accurate about our sales forecasting. And I will repeat from the beginning of the talk, you guys I'm an engineer, right? I mean not only Am I not good at that stuff? I really dislike it, right? <laughs> <laughs> and yet it was crucial to the business. It was very, very important that we be able to do that. Um, I went to the board, I had a conversation with them about a change in roles. Um, we talked about it, they were very supportive. 
uh, and we very quietly launched a search in the very early part of 2014. Yeah, yeah, Tom's coming up on two. No, 2015, yeah, uh, 20, uh, late in the night. Um, we very quietly launched a search. The company didn't know what we were doing. Um, only the actual board members, even the management team didn't know. Um, we talked to a lot of good candidates. Tom Riley, who wound up ta taking the job, had stepped in as the CEO in place of a technical founder who stayed in the company previously. Uh, when he was at ArcSight, he did that. Uh, and he ran ArcSight up to a very successful IPO and then acquisition by Hewlett Packard where he hung around for a while. Tom's a sales guy from the ground up, right? I mean, that's where he was born, that's what he does, that's what he loves. He's a perfect compliment to me, right? I'm, I'm an engineer. Right, I still know how the software works. I like thinking about it. We're like Batman and Robin. Right? You can't sneak up behind us. We built a very good relationship over the last couple of years. And that has a lot to do with him and his character. He's worked very hard to be sure that our relationship is good, that it works. And it's let me spend my time in the field talking to customers about what they're doing, what we can do together, to work with our partners in building out full stack solutions on top of this database layer of the 2010s uh, so that we can really go to market at high value. Um, I get to come and talk to groups like this, right? I get to concentrate my time on the stuff that I am both confident at and enjoy best. And, and I think where I'm really uniquely able in the company to do a good job. My job title is Chief Strategy Officer. You guys know what that does, the CSO does? Yeah, you have no idea, do you? <laughs> That's why this is a good job. <laughs> the, job is, the job is kind of whatever it needs to be at any given time. Um, it's been a fantastic trans transition. I'm proud of a lot of stuff at Cloudera. I I'm proud of a lot of stuff at Cloudera. But I'm most proud of the way we executed that transition. Um, actually, just one more anecdote. So we found Tom, and he and I spent like the spring really hanging out together and being sure that we'd be able to work together. And the management team didn't know at the time, just a, just a very small group in the boardroom knew, knew what was going on. I was super nervous about the transition because usually you know what happens, right? The new guy comes in and the old guy gets run over by a bus. <laughs> um, Tom and I talked a lot about it. I don't think either one of us wanted it. But I spent some time talking with folks at Google where, uh, where Sergey and Larry had very effectively handed off to Eric, right? They'd made that transition work. Uh, and I want to understand how they did that. I went and spent a lot of time with Reed Hoffman at LinkedIn, who had been CEO, stepped back. That didn't work so good, he stepped back in. And then he brought in Jeff Wiener, and they're running a fantastic business together. Um, and they executed that transact transition very, very well. Um, we approached it intentionally. So here's how it happened. We geared up, like, in the end of May, beginning of June, we brought the senior staff into the room uh, and basically told them what was happening. Uh, and a day or two later, we told the entire company. That was no time at all because it's a big secret and you couldn't keep it, right? So we didn't want to give a lot of time. So we told the company and simultaneously publicly announced it. And then Tom and I were both together at the company for a week, right? And we talked to everybody and walked around the entire organization and met with every single group. And separately and together, we explained what the transition was. And then Tom left. He disappeared for a month, right? And I spent the time letting the company like grief, right? Oh my God, Mike, is it gonna have, what's gonna have, it's a sales guy for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Talking to everybody through it, making sure that they had a chance to be heard. Uh, and then Tom came back. Uh, and about a week later, I left. And I turned my phone off and I didn't answer email. And I was gone and the intent was, you know, if you didn't understand what Tom was, you didn't like what you were, you couldn't call me, right? It's Tom's the CEO, you gotta deal with him. Um, I intentionally have no direct reports today and that's a hangover from that original change. If there had been Tom Riley with a bunch of the exec team and Mike Olson with a small team over here, it could have been Tom's guys and Mike's guys and would have been a mess, right? So we very carefully approached that trans transition, and I'm super proud of how well it went. I'm super, super proud. Um, it was really hard work, and emotionally, by the way, difficult, right? CEO, I think the Middle East is ego, 
Uh, <laughs> even if you want to get rid of the job, it's a hard thing to do. Um, but we've made it work. And, and I will say, uh, great for the business and great for me personally. Uh, I think Cloudera is way better off. We could never have done that Intel deal if it was Mike Olson's company. We could do it because it was Tom and Mike working together, and he was driving the engagement and strategy. Um, this is like a year plus later. We continue to grow. Uh, business continues to do very, very well. The market's getting a lot more interesting and competitive, and that's been uh, fun to watch unfold in the recent year. Uh, and we expect that to continue. But, but look, on the back of enormous opportunity. Uh, I said last year, tail end of the year at the Hadoop World Conference, I believe this is a $1 trillion a year market. I believe that that much will be spent on big data, data analytics, storage, processing across the spectrum. Platform, applications, tools, services, all of that is going to roll up to a trillion dollars in the aggregate because we're going to drive so much value out of that data that it will be worth the money to do that. That's about 10 times the size of the traditional business data processing market right now. But I, it kind of stands to reason if data volumes are going up by a thousand, you ought to be able to grow the revenue by a factor of 10. You ought to be able to get at least 10 times the value out of that data. Um, given that opportunity, every single major and venture-backed company on the planet is interested in this space, and we're watching lots and lots of activity happen. Um, thanks for listening to my long ramble. I'll stop now. Rob, you want to come up and, yeah. and do some Q&A? Let's get Mike up. Ten. Um, anyone who wants to ask a question? Anyone who wants to ask a question, you want to line up here. So, and and so, um, uh, <laughs> so uh, I'll I'll get started with the first one, which is maybe just talk a little bit about the consumerization part, which was on the title of your of your talk. So, so it seems like a lot of the way had, um, Cloudera's model is, is very traditional enterprise sales, enterprise marketing, enterprise um, deployment and services, and, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of that is, has been sort of very painful, very problematic, and you see a lot of new models. You, you see kind of SaaS-like models, you see Dropbox-like models, um, what 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 are your thoughts about uh, just uh, kind of how to build an enterprise company? Um, it's an excellent question. Uh, so the first thing that I'll point out is, for my entire life, I've been an enterprise software guy, right? I mean, you know, if if there's a database, I probably touched it. Um, around the time we were getting started, the hot companies were Zynga and Groupon. And those guys used to drive me nuts, right? I mean, like we'd grind away for months at a deal, and we'd bring it home. And these guys were selling imaginary pigs. <laughs> and they're making good money, right? Right? So, so look, we didn't build a traditional consumer business because we didn't know how to build a traditional consumer business. Um, what interested me, though, was that the meaningful innovation had come from the consumer internet and not from the digital <clears throat> space. And you know, I spent 25 years in <clears throat> academic, and then, oh yeah, and shout out to Stonebreaker Touring Award, man. Mm -hmm. You know what? This is the first year that there's a $1 million prize attached to that, right? Stonebreaker waited till now. <laughs> 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 As if he needs all that money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, 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 it is interesting to me that the traditional academic and industrial database research didn't basically build this scale out platform. I, I think it's classic innovators dilemma. We were so focused on the very high end, very demanding, refined problems that we had been born to solve, OLTP problems especially, that we didn't see the opportunity in, in the other thing. Um, so I think that the consumer sector is inventing technologies now that are moving into the enterprise. Look at Dropbox, right? A, a service that and Box as well that we use a bunch of at Cloudera. Um, but if you look at our sales force, if you look at our go-to-market model, I mean, we look a whole lot more like 
IBM and Oracle and Sybase and Microsoft, then we look like Zynga or Google, right? We, we don't have that kind of virality. We still slug it out uh, in the old fashioned way for every sale. Does that answer the question? Yes. Yeah. Millen? So, Millen? Yeah, I have one question. I actually have two is, questions. Can you guys hear us? The microphone? First, yeah, the first one I'm, uh, I'm going to ask him first uh, is uh, where do you think the whole containers and, uh, uh, you know, the Kubernetes coming out of Google, where does that fit with this whole data uh, analytics ecosystem? And, and then I will ask the second question. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so let me answer that one. And actually, I bet there's a lot of people in the room, including, yeah, yeah. including Lynn, who have uh, um, some thoughts on that. We view that containerization, at least from Cloudera's point of view, as in some sense orthogonal to the big data platform we deliver. That is to say, containerization is a very interesting technology. How do we make sure that we're taking advantage of containerization and easy deployment in the context of delivering big data infrastructure. Um, I think that containerization is crucial to making large scale public and private clouds work. You gotta have, right? Um, those of you who have watched the announcements in the space lately, and especially Google's move on Kubernetes, you know, you stop and you think for a little bit. Very, very interesting, right? What Kubernetes as open source promoted technology does is make it incredibly easy for workloads to migrate to the Google Cloud. Right, so if I were Google, I'd probably invent a thing like that as well. Um, we see public cloud deployment of our platform as a major strategic imperative, a big driver of revenue in not very many years. We've got a, a modest number of customers, but some very big ones running on public cloud today. Uh, we've got a whole bunch more running on sort of Elastic, OpenStack, or VMware style uh, elasticities in their own data centers. So we're paying close attention. Um, hard to say yet exactly how it needs to be integrated into all the platform, but but it's certainly an area that we're paying attention to. Right? Uh, and, and the second question that I had, and you knew it was coming because I had warned you before, is uh, uh, you know a lot of people have read your blog post about ODP, yes, uh, uh, open data platform that uh, when I was at the hotel, I basically championed. Uh, so what is, is, it, is it still uh, sort of a enemy territory for you or are you going to be joining that at some time? Uh, so this is a little bit inside baseball. Not all of you may know uh, what ODP is. Um, an announcement uh, some weeks, maybe a month ago now, by Hortonworks, one of our competitors in the market, and Pivotal, another uh, of our competitors in the market, to collaborate on basically a standard bundle of bits uh, for people who wanted to run a uh, big data platform. Um, it is called the open data platform. Uh, I have no problem with it except that I don't believe it's open and it's not particularly a data platform. Um, outside of those two flaws, uh, <laughs> the, the, the core technology that's bundled is kind of the oldest part of the Hadoop ecosystem. So that original stuff, HDFS and, and MapReduce, um, where there's really no kind of compatibility problems, right? Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, God, you know, I was running this great MapReduce on Hortonworks, and, and, then, and then I want to go run that MapReduce on Cloudera, and it didn't work. I mean, that's just not true, right? The, the APIs have been so stable for so long that migration among the platforms doesn't matter. Same is true for this storage layer, HDFS. Um, there's a lot of innovation in the open source ecosystem right now. There's all of these components that are flying around the edges and trying to get in none of which are in the proposed open data platform. Um, I, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. One is that it's tough to get broad industry consensus around a standard platform when every single vendor has their proprietary implementation of a piece of that technology that would transgress the standard. So, so I think, look, you know, it, it's, it's easy to get people to come together on a kernel of technology that's kind of ossified and not moving very fast, I don't think it's useful. Um, the other piece of technology in the open data platform is candidly the Hortonworks management console. And remember I said Cloudera has its own management console. Well, I mean, <laughs> in, in a way the, the alliance was designed to make it impossible for me to come in, right? The only way I could do that would be to say, yeah, my competitor's product is better than mine. Surprisingly, we're not 
willing to say that. Um, <laughs> we don't think it's true, but we're not willing to say it. Um, I don't see that ODP solves a problem, um, and therefore, I don't think it's necessary for us to participate. We think we always have that the right place to drive standards is in the Apache Software Foundation, right? You show up, you bring the code, you implement the APIs, and then you can say how those APIs should behave. But that's the way you get to play, right? Um, that is our approach to standards and where we're going to be. I have a question about the, uh, the transition of executives when you stepped aside about Tom and yeah. Uh, and you also mentioned LinkedIn and some other examples. Um, from someone who was sitting in the, the top chair and then stepping aside, what did you observe about <coughs> Tom's decision making and the type of people he brought in that just either took you by surprise or was just so different from how you approach it? What, what were the what were the real kind of qualitative differences in how you approach the CEO job? So a world class CEO has only a few jobs, right? You have to drive alignment on the team. You absolutely must do that. Everybody in the company has to know what you're doing and why. You gotta get the very best people into those jobs. You gotta be sure that you're coaching and mentoring them and that you're supporting them. If they're not, if they're not absolutely world-class at everything, that you're helping them to de develop and you're backing them up with others that can do it. You gotta be able to provide the resources. You gotta raise the money right, that the, the company needs to operate. And then finally, you've got to impose the discipline and the plan so everybody knows how the companies behave and what it's gonna do. Tom is without question better at me, better than me on every one of those. You know, you guys, I'm an engineer, right? You know, an extroverted engineer is the guy who stares at the other person's shoes when he talks to them. <laughs> <laughs> when there was conflict on the team, it was tempting, sometimes too tempting, and I took the temptation to avoid it, right? Not to kind of drive alignment, not to force everybody into agreement on something, but to step back because it was just easier than raising those issues. If I had to highlight my failure as a manager, I hire too slowly. That is to say, we need a marketing guy, but you know, I still really want to understand what customers are talking about, so I'm gonna get out and I'm gonna to talk to all the customers. I'm gonna postpone that marketing hire for another six months while I just be sure that I really understand what the business is doing, right? So too slow to hire, right? I should have brought those people in earlier. We could have used the skills. And I'm also too slow to fire, right? I mean, you're not 100% on your hiring. When someone doesn't work out, you gotta have the stomach to walk them out back and shoot them in the head, right? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was also too slow to do that, right? Hire someone into, and I picked this because it's not the example I mean, but hire someone to a finance job, and if they weren't doing a world-class job, well, what, am I gonna like mentor the guy in finance? Right, I'm an engineer, right? Um, so I think a really good hiring manager is fast to hire and fast to fire, and I was slow on both of those, and it cost the company. Um, Laying out the strategy, Tom's done a very good job. He's come up with a bunch of our branding. I would say that that's the place where, where I feel like, like maybe I, 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 I was at least decent uh, as the company got big in the CEO role. Um, and then basically building the plan, imposing the operational discipline. Again, that's a lot of attention to budgeting and planning and forecasting and, and all of that's important. But you know, I didn't wake up in the morning, yeah man, staff meetings, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, in every one of those respects, I think he came in and did the job that the company needed him to. It's been fun to watch him drive that alignment, right? That, that's really the, the core skill that, that I'm, I'm, I'm still super impressed by. I have a question that goes more to sort of the Hadoop market and so you know, it uh, impacts you but your competitors also, which is we are probably in the early stages where um, you know, a CIO, a CIO probably looks stupid if he doesn't have some Hadoop in his house, him, his or her house. So their the enterprises are, are getting, you know, initial Hadoop. What is it that's really going to drive, um, you know, where much like Oracle, where people are saying, give me four of those or give me eight of those every quarter, uh, or they call NetApp and say, just 42 more of those filers, just send them over. Yeah. What's going to drive that? All right, so I'm going to I'm going to go off on you a little bit, and then I'll come back and answer that. So, so seven years, you guys, seven years, right? For seven years, there have been two big 
two big attacks. But the people have said to us two things, kind of like, come on, man. First is, man, this is just a bunch of early stage stuff. You know, it's not time yet, still way too early, nobody's gonna adopt. You know, it's, it, we're gonna wait, we're gonna sit back. Come on, Mike, isn't the market too early? And the other is, dude, just hype, just hype. You know, yeah, you think you're big, but come on, that bubble's gonna pop. Seven years later, north of 100 million bucks in revenue, I will assert to you it's not quite as early stage as you think, and there's at least enough meat on the bone to justify real purchases. Um, those have been consistent criticisms of us and of the market and of the technology, right? Um, but you know, in a way, they're legitimate. So the market is something better than doubling every year. If you stop and think about what that means practically, that means always most of the market is newbies. Three quarters of the market has only been here for two years or less, right? Um, half the market just showed up this year. So you would expect in that world for most of the deployments that are going on to be kind of early stage, we're still trying to figure it out, we're trying to make sense of it. I started out in databases in the 1980s, right? In, in, in the middle 1980s, you could not hire an Oracle DBA, right? That skill set didn't exist in the market. You can just go find it. You, you couldn't go buy an app that ran on top of, an, of a relational database and use it to run your business. Those apps hadn't been built yet. At the time, SQL hadn't won, right? There were still Quell and IDL in the market. That market matured because skills proliferated, so people began to understand how to operate and use the platform. Um, but most significantly because tools and applications came out that made the platform consumable. You didn't need to be a C programmer anymore to use a relational database, right? You just buy some software. A business user could point a BI tool at basically a big pile of data and could find stuff out and didn't need to understand the technology that was underneath. This market will accelerate growth precisely because of that. So I give you a couple of examples of real full stack applications now that are running and that you can just go buy, right, that solve meaningful problems. Um, Amdocs and BAE Systems both offer to telecommunications providers software that unifies their BSS, uh, uh, basically business support systems and OSS, operating support systems. So forever, if you were a, if you were a mobile phone carrier, if you're a mobile carrier, you, you had like a bunch of towers and, and wires and all of that, on, and, and your OSS, your operating support system, ran that infrastructure. And you had a business support system so you could send out bills to people, right? The problem, historically, because those systems were separate, was you couldn't think about your network in terms of your customers very easily. Example, I pay way too much money to my mobile carrier every single month. Right, I'm, I'm on some crack pipe plan that costs $200 a month. I'm like the only guy in North America that spends $200 a month on just basic. And I fly overseas all the time where I go ahead and eat that ridiculously expensive data, right? I am like, the mo Verizon should show up at my house and give me massages. Right? <laughs> when I drive home, there is a persistent dead spot on my drive, right? And I don't call them to complain about it, but every single day, I get pissed off at my carrier, right? They'd like to be able to know who I am and notice that once a day I drive through a dead spot. And if they're going to go optimize their network, they should like put a cell tower in that neighborhood just, just for me. That's <laughs> my 200 bucks a month, right? But they've never been able to do that before, right? They can fill in gaps in their network, but they don't know how that affects their highest revenue ARPU customers, right? So these vendors now have created a way to take all the data from those legacy systems, load it into an enterprise data hub, a cloud platform, and combine it and do those analyses and decide we can make the biggest difference in retention if we optimize the network in this particular neighborhood, right? Silicon Valley, there are gonna be a lot of those opportunities. Um, so, in, and, and, and now you don't have to know anything about Hadoop. You just go buy that from those vendors and you get it. So business users can start to specify that. I can give you examples in finance for sort of risk quantification and equities portfolios. Talk about healthcare, you know, sort of outcome, delivering better outcomes more cheaply by doing machine learning across the, all of the patient engagements that happen. Doctors don't know about Hadoop. Doctors know about patients. They want an app that helps them understand their patients. 
And if it has some Hadoop under the covers, the doctor doesn't care. Those apps drag the platform into deployments. And that's when, you know, people are going to call up and say, hey, we need six Hadoops, stat, right? Um, so that's exactly what we need to see. Apps. Packaged applications. That's Packaged apps and solutions and the ecosystem, systems integrators and, and data center staff who understand the platform. All of that's going to happen, right? It's all underway right now, but that's what really unlocked the value in the relational market. Question? I'll take one. Actually, it's a quick one. What would you comment technically on Spark? Um, so again, for those of you not uh, playing this particular brand of inside baseball, uh, <laughs> Hadoop started with this storage system and a single distributed processing engine. And over time, others have come into existence. So there's now a variety of engines for fast SQL query, and there are tools for NoSQL data service and search and so on. Research project at UC Berkeley, beginning as many as eight years ago, uh, created a piece of software called Spark, S-P-A-R-K. Um, it gives you large scale out data processing capabilities without a lot of the drawbacks of Hadoop. But it's not fair because Spark was designed with its eye on Hadoop. Mm -hmm. The designers of Spark knew what the troubles were when you try to program and use Hadoop, MapReduce in particular, and so they designed a different programming model, uh, much lower latency, much higher performance engine. It is lights out awesome. I'm on record as saying it will be the successor to MapReduce, okay. right? Um, it's much easier to develop. And by the way, that doesn't mean MapReduce is going to go away. And you can still find a COBOL programmer if you walk down the street. <laughs> <laughs> a, lot, a lot of very expensive jobs, a lot of cycles yeah. are spent yeah. on COBOL jobs every single month, right? right? But the new stuff is happening in newer systems. So we expect total MapReduce use to go up over time because there's so much yeah, entrenched use in MapReduce. But all of the interesting new applications we think are going to move to Spark. Um, we bundled Spark into our distro. We're actually, um, I don't know what the stats are this month, but a couple months back, Databricks, the company backed by Andreessen Horowitz to commercialize Spark, uh, and TypeSafe, the Scala company, ran a survey. Cloudera is the single largest commercial distributor of Spark in the world. Right? So we're happy to embrace these alternative programming frameworks because they run well on our scale out infrastructure. What we do is deliver a platform for enterprise use. So you got to think about security, data governance, user and role based authentication and access control, um, compliance reporting, who touched the data, what do they do with it. All of that stuff over the last seven years we built in our platform and when you use Spark on our platform you get it. That's not there in the open source Spark only uh, products available in the market right now. They'll probably get there. Um, over the years we've been able to add a lot to our Hadoop distro, right? It, it was just HDFS and MapReduce. Now we've got six or seven different processing and analytic engines. I don't think we're done adding them, by the way. I think we'll see a couple more uh, emerge. Our big challenge right now is there's so much innovation happening in the ecosystem that just keeping track of what's going on is a major challenge. In a way, that's good for us because, you know, if you're an insurance company, you for sure don't want to be watching the, the uh, Apache repositories and everybody's GitHub to see what's hot and what's cool, right? You want someone to do that for you, and Cloudera provides that service among others. But we're very, very bullish on Spark. Young technology, still got some stability, security, and, and other work to do, but, but it's, boy, it's come a long way in a few years. Your comments on, uh, there was the, at some point, Oracle was going to apply to Cloudera because they told me that. Kim <laughs> 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 Stevenson is going to recuse herself and saddle up and compete for the deal. So yeah. I, it, I, I think we're protected by the Intel relationship. Yeah. We, look, I, I mean, I, I'll, be a, I'll be a little bit I'll be a little bit more pugilistic here. People have been saying forever that I planned to sell Cloudera to Oracle. They said that because we sold Sleepy Cat to Cloudera. Yeah. Look, Rob, to Cloudera. Uh, to, to Cloudera. Yeah. No, I, I'm sorry. Right. I was thinking of the other multi <laughs> All of Rob Bearden's companies were acquired by others as well, right? Um, the most common outcome for a venture-backed company 
is failure. Second place is M&A. A very, very few get to the point where they can go IPO, right? I think we've reached the scale now where we're able to have an IPO. I mean, if you look at us, look where our revenue is, look at the composition of the board, look at the growth that we've had, we think we're in great shape. We're under no pressure to do that. Um, I love the time I spent at Oracle. I really did. We want to build the number one big data company on the planet. And right now, we look around the market and we believe that the company called Cloudera is the most likely to take that title for the long term. Right. So if there were a company that looked more like it would be able to do that than we are, then you know maybe that's an interesting transaction. Right. But I think we've built a business now that's able to get there on our own. And, and that's always, always, always been the dream. It was never, ever our intent to sell. That's not to say it's impossible that a transaction would happen. I mean, I'm a chairman of the board. I'm, I've got a fiduciary obligation. But we see all kinds of forward opportunity in the business right now. Lots of growth. And, and, and you know, if we just play our cards for a few more years and live up to those uh, hopes, we're going to deliver much higher returns for our shareholders than any company could justify putting into the business right now. I mean, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to pay a high multiple on a business if you're Oracle, IBM, or HP because you've got to answer the, to the street, right? Um, we'd, rather, we'd rather play the cards that we're holding. But, but if Hadoop is the future, then you should expect SAP, uh, Oracle, IBM, to get into that business, and we've already lost two of the Hadoop uh, distributions. I, I lost a million, a few minutes, right? Well, there is. And, and so, lost the distribution. Yeah. Just moved, it moved it to someone else. <laughs> so, so, so look, it's fair, it's fair to say that, uh, you know, and, and you can look at SAP and Oracle as great examples. It's, it's fair to say that those vendors have an interest in this technology. But, you know, those vendors were one day oh, smaller than we are. In fact, if you look at our growth trajectory, zero years old to seven years old, almost no company, including those two, has gotten to $100 million as fast as we have, right? It's very, very, very rare that somebody does that. Um, those companies had large entrenched competitors at the time, right? They managed to emerge and build long standalone businesses. We intend to do the same thing here. Of course, we've got to execute well. That doesn't mean, by the way, those guys are in trouble. I would love to have the revenues, the scale, the installed base that the major vendors do. Absolutely would love that. We, we want to get there one day. But I think those big companies are going to be around delivering real value for their customers for a long time. I just think we're going to be able to go do something different than they do and make a very good living building. Two questions. So, so one, uh, I, I used to work for Zynga, so we work for Zynga. Oh, Zynga. Zynga. Yeah. <laughs> I, I love your pigs, man. <laughs> we did too. Like, uh, <laughs> you know, we used to make like millions of dollars for us. Right? Yeah. Um, so, so back when, like, you know, moving from a 30 node vertical cluster to a 2,000 node cloud era um, for the big data, it, it it took a long time for these consumer companies to to move into the cloud era. It primarily the reason is the kind of scale that you see in consumer internet applications, you really see the same scale in enterprise applications. And and, and so because like you know my fire hose, um, yeah, I, I would spin up like 3,000 node cluster whenever there was a big game and when we were doing the whole cross promotion. Right? Mm -hmm. So it would crank up like, you know, 10 million, 20 million DIUs per, per day, like, you know, and, and humongous, Thing. So, people from the consumer internet, like you know, when, when they look at that scale and that scale of computing, and how do you compare that in the enterprise? Because usually you don't see the same scale. And do you really need that level of computation? So I'll tell you a couple things. Um, one is that. Uh, sorry, I just lost my thought. So, uh, how about that scale? Um, almost. Yeah. Okay. So first, first observation. The consumer internet companies have done a fantastic job of innovating on technology. Mostly you guys are just a pain in the ass. Right? <laughs> you never pay for anything, right? Especially um, Zynga. <laughs> no, not just, no. I mean, not especially Zynga. 80K for 3,000 new clusters. That's right. <laughs> the, um, the observation is that companies at that scale can afford 
the DevOps skills to make it run themselves. They're good customers to have if you're Cloudera because they drag you over broken glass on scalability, right? They force you to make the platform work at that scale, right? Now, there are a whole bunch of perfectly respectable distributed storage and, query and processing and, and analytic workloads that run on 20 nodes, you know? There are a bunch we've got that run on hundreds or even a couple of thousands of nodes, right? Every single company that we do business with likes the idea that they could incrementally grow their way to that large cluster if they needed to. The fact that it does scale is reassuring because, you know, if you're choosing a platform for this stuff, you're making like a 10 year decision, right? Nobody, nobody chooses DB2 Parallel Edition for a week, right? That is, that is an enterprise grade decision and we want our customers to have the confidence that it's going to scale up there. It is the case that use cases expand and data volumes expand over time. It's also the case that hardware gets more capable. Disks get denser and you get more of them on and you get more storage and more memory. Those damn Intel guys, man. I tell you what, <laughs> right? Um, the the 1,000 node cluster that you can deploy today is vastly more powerful than the 1,000 node cluster that Yahoo was running in 2008 when we started Cloudera. Vastly more powerful. And look, we don't have a lot of customers running at multi-thousand node scale. We do have some so that they know that it gets there. But there are a huge number of workloads in traditional enterprises that run on tens or hundreds or, or like a thousand nodes. And I believe that that collection of workloads expands as we see more of these solutions get built on top and people just go buy the, the application that solves that problem, that sucks more data platforms in. So yes, you, you said two questions. So the, the second question is, um, around last year at Google I.O., first host it says Google no longer uses MapReduce <laughs> internally, right? And uh, you know, when Google first said, hey, we use MapReduce, then, then the whole Hadoop started, right? And now they say, hey, we no longer use MapReduce. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts about that. Uh, so first of all, the rumors of MapReduce's demise at Google are much exaggerated. Um, I like that meme because remember that story I told you about innovation and now we've got distributed query processing and Impala and Search and Spark bundled into the platform. Um, I like the idea that these newer technologies are how the innovator in the space is building out its own infrastructure with Spanner. It's Impala equivalent and with you know uh, other stream and query processing technologies. Um, it would be surprising if the implementation of software that was born at Google in 2004 were still in use in, in substantially the same form 11 years later. I mean you would have to think that Google was pretty stupid, right? Yeah. Um, of course the software evolves over time, of course it gets better, and of course as we get experience with it we invent new ways of working with data. People hear Spark is going to kill Hadoop. And that's a very simple meme, but look, Spark is part of the Hadoop ecosystem, right? Mm -hmm. If Spark means fewer jobs will be running on MapReduce, I don't care. In fact, that's good with me because more kinds of applications can run on a real-time piece of infrastructure. Um, we're very close to Google. Their investment is an example. We spend time at the Googleplex talking to the folks there about what they're doing. Um, we watch the consumer internet pretty carefully for technologies that are interesting and that are worth paying attention to. We recently embraced a piece of software out of LinkedIn. Jay Kreps has created a company now um, to commercialize Kafka, uh, basically streaming data ingest. All of this innovation can roll into this open source ecosystem and interoperate with the other stuff. Our job as a vendor, really the only hassle in all this, is that there's just so much going on that we have to pay attention to, right? But, uh, you know, I, uh, Google's infrastructure and data processing uh, and analytics strategy have changed a lot, but it hasn't been because they made like a big switch from old system to new system. It's been evolutionary over time, right? And you can still find remnants of MapReduce, right, across the organization. A bunch of very important jobs run. Yeah. So your vision is to be the enterprise data hub. Uh, the mm -hmm. Stonebreaker says that you know only part of the only about five percent of the jobs will be embarrassingly parallel, and 
most of the value will be created with the memory databases and array databases and things like that. Uh, so what's missing in your stack and who do you plan to buy? Uh, so who do I find to buy? <laughs> <laughs> no, I find this always a good stretch. Go down the and bend right? like this. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, late in the evening, but uh, I won't even <laughs> declare no tweet on this. Let me tell you a little anecdote. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Mike Stonebreaker is. As we said, he was my advisor in graduate school. Um, he was very good for my career. I'm a little vain. I think I was also reasonably good for his career. Um, we, uh, we remain good friends, and we always have. Stonebreaker and another database researcher, Dave DeWitt, went off on Hadoop about seven, eight years ago. I mean, like, you know, papers published in all the journals and blog posts. I mean, they really did not like Hadoop. They had a couple of observations, and, and here's a fair one. You know this idea about scale-out data processing? That's not like Google invented that idea, right? In fact, you know, back in the 70s, IBM and others were doing great work on, on those ideas. And okay, you know, you slap those consumer internet guys on them. They didn't cite those papers. They probably weren't born when they were written, right? <laughs> but but so, so there's a little bit of, a little bit of uh, maybe lack of acknowledgement of the old platform. And, and by the way, you could look at MapReduce and you could see that it was kind of not really well suited to lots of jobs, and you could attack it on that basis. But, but Mike and Dave hated the idea of Hadoop, and they, and they wrote about it a lot. And then, you know, I left Oracle, and I kind of got a little bit of a crush on Hadoop, and I said, I want to go do something. <laughs> so I talked Jeff and Amr and Christoph, you know, we all decided we we're going to come together as a company. I better call Stonebreaker, right? And I, I got to tell him that I'm going to do this thing. I call him up. Mike, it's Mike, how are you? Good, Mike, good, good. <laughs> Listen, man, I just want to tell you, uh, I started a company, and, and I wanted to be sure you heard it from me first, so, so we're going to be commercializing Hadoop. Was it's this after post. the blog post or yeah. before? Oh, well after. Okay. Right? Yeah. Long pause on the phone. <laughs> Mike, Hadoop's a piece of shit. <laughs> <laughs> Does, does anyone in the room know what Stonebreaker's newest company is doing? Um, data ingest for Hadoop. The question was kind of, you know, uh, what workloads belong on Hadoop and what doesn't? What workloads belong on MapReduce? A certain set. What workloads belong on our distributed query processing engine, Impala? Uh, a, a good set and a different set. What should run on this stream processing and DAG execution engine Spark? A different set. The platform is way more capable than it used to be. If you want to run one of those uh, sort of big, you know, uh, high performance computing workloads, like if you want to simulate a nuclear explosion and, and every single voxel needs to be connected to all of the voxels, or it's just it's an incredibly interconnected mesh. Hadoop sucks for that, right? This architecture was not designed for that kind of very close, lots of communication. You know what? Totally go buy yourself a great big grid computer, right? Um, it has been surprising to us how many algorithms can be recast in a data parallel way, right? And also in how the ecosystem has produced a bunch of new infrastructure. Spark has a lot of strengths. You know what a really key one is? It's the first engine in the entire ecosystem that consciously makes use of memory well, right? I mean, you get a thousand nodes together, you got a pretty good in-memory database across that thing, as long as you can design the query uh, strategy to exploit it. So look, I think the question, what does Hadoop not do well, is an ill-advised question. We all slammed Hadoop in 2004 because MapReduce was obviously not able to handle our transaction processing workloads. But what we call Hadoop today is, is a very different engine. And it will continue to improve. By the way, Oracle Database 12 is way more interesting than Oracle 9 was. And the guys at Teradata have added good geo support into their enterprise. All of the vendors are making their products better. I would even say that the emergence of Hadoop has accelerated innovation in the database market in response to competition. So I think that everybody's platform is going to get better. Um, Hadoop doesn't do transactions. This scale out, share nothing, distributed storage architecture does not do transactions well. 
I think that's actually a pretty hard problem to solve, right? I mean, we've been trying to build real scale out global uh, global scale databases with uh, trans asset consistency for a long time, and it's been hard. It's been hard. We got some of the best researchers in the in the world in the room. Um, so I wouldn't expect people to be turning off OLTP or sort of OLAP SBA style spin the cube applications in the near term. Um, Hadoop is aimed at a different class of shared nothing more. Um, we're five Take minutes from the end two, of time. That's two a more. short question. Yeah. Um, so the, what's your reaction to the taller mics uh, uh, post on the CACM blog, which was uh, towards the end of last year? I don't know if you read it. I don't remember the post. Yeah, well, basically the one that said, uh, you know, by the time you guys all get around to doing all your proprietary stuff and so on, and you compare it with the traditional database system, the difference is pretty much going to be where the data is stored, whether it's in a traditional database managed storage or it's in HDFS and that kind of uh, place. Because you are all now basically re-implementing parallel database technology with uh, all well, the things that are currently in progress within Parla and so on. Yeah, so, so the that, that was the point he was yeah, making. The implementation that we're doing is fundamentally designed to scale out very, very big on this shared nothing infrastructure. Um, and look, I, I mean, in in many respects, I owe my career to Stonebreaker, right? But my answer is, you know what then? Let's wait and see, right? This is right now today, a better than $100 million a year business growing twice, 2x a year, right? I mean, this is, one of the real success stories in the database industry. Very, very few companies have gotten to where we are. Um, I think we've got lots of roadmap, lots of analytic workloads that we're gonna be able to go attack. Our job isn't to compete with Oracle for OLTP. It's not to compete with Teradata or Natiza for OLAP workloads. And you know, I, I've said this in public a bunch of times. We can't possibly get rich just knocking down old guys and stealing their wallets. Right? <laughs> competing, competing for the markets that are already owned by these big, well-capitalized companies is just stupid, right? The only way you do that is what MySQL did in the database market. We're gonna drive a $30 million market to $3 million, $3 billion, $30 billion to $3 billion, and then we're gonna be one of the guys left standing. I and mean, what a crappy world that would be, right? Um, our goal is to help people monetize data at a scale that it could never be monetized before and to use new storage and analytic techniques to do that, and I bet we build a pretty damn good business doing it. Um, there will be, for the coming 10 years, more and more interesting technology in the data centers than there were in the prior 10 years. You know, I mean, look, man, we did great work in the database industry, but let's be honest, you know, last 15 years, tighten the screws, polish the chrome, you know, charge through for some more a year, right? Nothing really interesting happened, right? Interesting to you and me, technically. But we didn't unlock new classes of data. We didn't unlock new classes of analytic applications. We have a customer who is using machine learning <laughs> over patient data from hospital records that they collect at large scale and predicting which patients are likelier to be susceptible to sepsis and intervening in their care, instructing the doctors to treat them differently because they are at risk of sepsis, a potentially fatal disease. These guys they estimate have saved hundreds of lives. I mean, all by itself, dude, that's a pretty good career, right? We're making applications possible that you couldn't write on the older systems. And I bet you we build a good business doing it. One last. You have to be nice to Robbie now, because, yeah. So, as a database person, coming forward, I think it's yeah, first it was, you know, we're gonna yeah, yeah. we're we're gonna put everything we can into Postgres and then one size doesn't fit all. Exactly. Yeah, so, so I had a thousand flowers blue. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, and and for those of you who haven't guessed, we were chatting beforehand. Uh, the founder of a database company, 
Um, so, so I understand where that question is coming from. Look, I, I think there's more interesting stuff going on right now in data management, data processing, than there has been in the last 25 years. Most of my career, I'd show up at a cocktail party and people say, what do you do? Uh, you know, I'm a database kernel implementer. <laughs> and then like nobody would talk to me. <laughs> Stand in the corner getting quietly drunk. <laughs> what we do right now is really hot, right? I mean, the story I tell you about, you know, predicting sepsis in blood and intervening to save lives, we're getting to tell stories like that because we're building systems that can attack them. I think more diversity in the database landscape is good. I think it's driving innovation. There's so much happening right now that it's a tough market, right? I mean, you know, you know how Darwin really works, right? <laughs> you let a thousand flowers bloom, and then you relentlessly and absolutely without remorse mow 999 of them down, right? Yep. So who's going to win? We don't know. I think, you know, from our point of view right now, because we've got sufficient scale, we kind of step back and wait to see what's being successful, and then we can reach out and buy it, right? Um, I think it's a very, very exciting time to be innovating in the space. I think there's lots of investment capital. If you want to go raise money, it's possible to do it. It's no harder to make a business successful today than it's ever been. In fact, I've got this long rant that I won't go off on now. Everybody talks about startups and how great it is that it's easy to start companies. You guys, you know what? It is blindingly hard to finish a company. <laughs> yeah. Really, really, everybody's like, I'm going to be a founder, man. Dude, you don't understand. You gotta show up for years and it's slog away doing the hard crap. And and like at the end, mostly you fail, right? Yeah. Um, building successful businesses remains hard. There's lots of opportunity, and the technology is letting us do lots more interesting stuff than we ever could before. So I think it's a pretty exciting time to be alive. But don't fool yourself into thinking that, you know, it's uh it, it's one venture capital round and three years of, of drinking Jolt Cola to, to <laughs> retiring on a beach because it ain't like that. All right, look, thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, so uh, 